Hi, everyone. Welcome back to the Matchbook series on the EBPL podcast. My name is Paul Kabala. I am the Adult Services Librarian here at EBPL. This is Season 4, Episode 4. And in keeping with that four repetition, it is April now, which means it is the month in which Earth Day is set. So, in honor of Earth Day, I wanted to touch on some books that evoke that theme in this episode. Focus on planet, habitation, humanity's effect on nature, all of the above. But I wanted to do so in a way where the books I'm going to mention maybe aren't the most alarmist of books because I find that could be alienating people. So I wanted to focus on books that are some like serious about the planet, but as well as being engaging, entertaining, and have at least a glimmer of hope in them. So just wanted to get that out of the way right front and center. Before we move on to the books that we're going to cover today, the first book I wanted to cover today is called Under the Sea Wind. And it's by marine biologist Rachel Carson. If that name sounds familiar, it's because she is most notably known for the publication of Silent Spring, which covers the harmful effects of pesticides on natural vegetation. But this book, this is her first published work, and it's a little bit different, but still on the theme of nature and the planet and how we affect the planet as well as how species orient themselves to nature. The background of the publication of this, I want to touch on that briefly because I found it to be pretty interesting. She had previously published this as a series of works with a more scholarly bent to them, but still in a way where it was meant to be palatable to most people who weren't marine biologists and could understand and really sink their teeth into something like this. And then it was read by this Dutch-born children's author named, I'm probably going to butcher this, Henrik von Loon. He encouraged her to publish this as a book and to really touch on the interconnectedness of species and add a more poetic flair to the writing. And she really took that to heart. And this was her foray into becoming a well-known public scholar. So I found that to be interesting. She really went with that theme and published this amazing book. And so term under the sea wind encompasses really three parts of the Atlantic coast. We follow a different organism that interacts with the sea and we view their habitat from their own perspective. So in three sections, the first one follows a sanderling, which is a small wading bird that lives at the edge of the sea. And then the second, we have a mackerel the fish, and then in the third, we have an eel. So by connecting these three creatures under the broad purview of their habitat, Carson casts this really empathetic portrait of how they survive, how they build shelters, how they avoid predators, how they feed. And you really get a good perspective of what they have to do every day. And in doing so, kind of builds back this interaction between humans and wildlife that is often sorely lacking. I'll go into a little bit about part one, and if that seems to pique your interest, I'll kind of leave it there and leave you to really dig into the rest of the book on your own. So part one, like I said, we have the sanderling, the shorebird, and we meet the sanderling at the time of spring migration. And follow the bird through the end of the summer when the movements of birds, other wildlife that lives near the sea, we see their movement and migration patterns heralding in the changing of the season. So this sanderling, among many other frightful tasks, has to compete with other migrating birds that occupy its territory briefly. And therefore, there's extreme competition for food and land and nesting. and then. We see a snowstorm that piles through during the end of spring and the eggs are frozen and shows how difficult it is to survive under those conditions. And the way, you know, while nesting at the same time, birds have to lure away other species that are nearby that might want to eat their young. And it seems so frightful and precarious and really makes you appreciate the will to survive that they have. 
and as well, you know, parts two and three have much of this as well, but I just kind of wanted to give you a brief description of what goes on in the book. But the complete portrait of all three together will make you realize the sea and the sand and the air, the interconnectedness of all three at this juncture and really appreciate how the nature of life and the life cycles of all these creatures feed into each other and make for a really balanced habitation and in a really beautiful prose that she uses to evoke that feeling. The next book I wanted to discuss is Pilgrim at Tinker Creek by American author Annie Dillard. This is another nonfiction work, and it's narrated by Dillard while in her mid-20s, I believe, and it's told from a first-person point of view, details the explorations of Tinker Creek near her home in Virginia's Blue Ridge Mountains. This work won the Pulitzer Prize for Nature Writing in 1974, and it follows her explorations at Tinker Creek in four sections, which is her way of dividing it into the seasons, basically, over the course of a year. And through her journeys, we meet a number of different creatures. The point of the book is really like a meditative journey for her. She really tries to let nature come to her, and she tries to be more of a fly on the wall kind of thing, more of an observer. So you see her stalking muskrats in the creek, and then tracking monarch butterflies and their migration patterns collecting pond water and looking at it under a microscope. There's a flood. There's games she plays with snakes, which is quite fun. So we get a real look at all the different creatures that live around this creek. So in doing so, this book records the narrator's thoughts on solitude, writing, observation of all the flora and fauna that is in the area. So what she's really trying to bring is a spiritual meditative perspective to all of this. So it touches on faith, nature, awareness of our surroundings, things like that. So in her dissection of what she's seeing around her in the natural world, she's really trying to get to the heart of the, the goodness in nature and the, the evil in nature. And she's casting it almost in a religious, spiritual context. So this is much different from your typical nature writing. While there are, you know, scientific facts included in this, the perspective is far more transcendentalist and closer to like a Henry David Thoreau almost. So if, if you're looking for a book like this that has different kind of bent on the subject of nature writing, our place on this planet and what our purpose is on Earth, both a natural and spiritual context, definitely check this book out. The final book I want to discuss today is called Underland, and it's by Robert McFarlane, who is a British nature writer most commonly known for a book called Mountains of the Mine, A History of Fascination. And this book explores all of the massive geological entities that exist on Earth and how they've become the symbols of a fascination and high-risk adventure for humanity, which is a really amazing subject and about how we process our surroundings and just want to conquer massive entities that exist on the earth because it's in our nature, I guess. So I won't be touching on that one too much today. I just wanted to throw that out there because that does also seem like an amazing topic and is definitely related to Earth Day and our purview here. But going back to our subject today, Underland by Robert McFarlane, this is his exploration of the underworlds that exist in the earth, like the land itself, but also as the life under the earth exists in myth, literature, memory, all things like that, and how we conceive of it in so many different ways and our relationship with it. So this is an excellent starting point where he's able to push and pull in so many different directions and take us to places that have become so significant for so many different reasons to humanity and history. So when it travels to the Paris catacombs, where we look at some ancient art, we meet botanists who tell us about all the interconnectedness of tree roots and how their relationship forms over hundreds of years 
in ways where they share nutrients, feed off of each other, and really sustain their own ecosystem underneath the land. We also ventured to a deep sunk hiding place where nuclear waste will be stored for approximately 100,000 years to come, which is a real fascinating look at the different types of properties and life forms that exist underneath the earth, what it means to humanity in a poetic and practical perspective. And it's told in a way where, you know, you have a basic core geography, but it's told with this lyricism that adds such beauty to it that you wouldn't really think about when approaching life under the earth. And it really serves to deepen our own perspective and appreciation for what exists there. So those are three books that I think represent what Earth Day means to us. Like I said, I tried to pick ones that are serious in their consideration of the Earth, but also add a glimmer of hope as well. The EBPL podcast can be listened to at ebpl.org backslash podcast. I want to thank Melissa Hosek for editing this episode, and I want to thank you all for listening. Happy Earth Day, everyone.